So I am pleased to introduce uh, this afternoon our uh, moderator, Judge Krangsak Kitty Chai Sari, uh, who has been a member of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea since 2017. He is joining us uh, live from Hamburg. Judge? Um, uh, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning from Hamburg. It's very nice to, to participate in this meeting, which is very important because the Lord is is very important to Southeast Asia. And uh, of course, uh, Ambassador Tomiko and several uh, eminent jurists from Southeast Asia shaped the third conference and the outcome of the third conference which is now the 1982 Lord of Sea Convention. And here we have three distinguished speakers who will share with us their respective uh, idea or recommendations or thinking about UNCLOS and Southeast Asia. First, we have Ambassador uh, Nian Hong Tao, has been member of the International Law Commission for I think five years now, and congratulations on his recent re-election to commission as well. We'll be speaking on UNCLOS and the fishery crisis, a critical perspective. And then he'll be followed by Ms. Daphne Hong, Director General of International Affairs Division of the Attorney General's Chamber of Singapore. And finally, by our good friend, Professor Bob Beckman of the Center of International Law of NUS himself. He will share with us his view on piracy and armed robbery against ships in Southeast Asia. May I now invite Ambassador Yen Hong Tao to present um, his uh, paper or PowerPoint on UNCLOS and the fishery crisis. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Judge uh, Krinsak uh, Kichisara. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues, uh, friends, uh, participants of the conference, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to <clears throat> express my sincere gratitude uh, to organizer of the conference especially uh, Professor Retired Tomikon and Director Professor Nulifer Oran, and uh, as well as uh, <coughs> CIL uh, teams for wonderful conference on the unclosed uh, at 40 an assessment. Uh, even I'm not uh, <coughs> in person in Singapore, uh, but it's a great opportunity uh, to join with distinguished speaker Azita Panensik. Uh, my presentation is uh, unclosed and the fishery crisis, a critical perspective uh, from the Southeast Asia. <coughs> and it will focus uh, on three questions. Uh, <coughs> unclosed 40, a new regime of uh, fishing progress and shortcoming. Uh, Southeast Asia in challenge of uh, fishery crisis and uh, a perspective uh, of history in the Southeast Asia. <coughs> so, um, uh, can I uh, propose uh, the uh, <coughs> technical team uh, uh, to share uh, my <coughs> uh, PowerPoint slide? <coughs> and uh, you know that uh, unclot is called as the constitution of the ocean by the respectful Ambassador Tomikon, the former president of the United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea. So uh, let me borrow uh, his word to call, unclothed as the constitution of fishery. Uh, 
uh, fishery issue uh, fragmented in 4 uh, 1958 <coughs> Geneva Convention uh, were replaced uh, with the new ocean fishery governance stipulated in the single enclosure. <coughs> the convention reallocated uh, responsibilities for conservation and management of uh, fishing resources uh, from the part of the common pool of high sea to coastal states. Uh, they have an uh, exclusive right to uh, in management of uh, fisheries uh, in the economic exclusive zone. Uh, however, other states enjoy also limited open assets to surplus uh, through uh, maximum sustainable right and total allowable catch. <coughs> yeah. uh, Mm, the scientific uh, recommendation uh, 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 technical. <coughs> yeah. And uh, now, uh, so that uh, the unclosed, <coughs> um, uh, the second, the second point. Uh, positive of UNCLOT, UNCLOT set also a different legal regime for each important stocks and uh, species in EZ and in high sea. Uh, it brings a revolutionary change in production of uh, aquatic living resources in harmony with the environment. Our colleagues mentioned in it the previous panel uh, four and five, uh, Professor Chi Kujena and uh, Liu, so I don't uh, repeat them more. <coughs> Unclot uh, was to be a framework uh, document for first elaborating and specifying new principles of uh, international fishery law, such as 1995 uh, Unclot Fish Stock Agreement for highly migratory species and straddling stock. The 1995 FAO Code of Conduct uh, for a Responsible uh, Fishery. And, <clears throat> and international plan of action for the management of fishing capacity. Uh, also, UN uh, Sustainable Development Goal uh, 14 and other. However, uh, the implementation of UNCLOS indicated some uh, shortcomings. First, uh, fishery management of uh, many states has not matched uh, which the fishery science demand. Uh, not all the developing countries have uh, adequate uh, relevant scientific data and uh, regulation uh, for implementation of annual MZI and TAC measures in place. By statistics, only seven uh, of stock are fished at the maximum sustainable size. Second, it uh, state the monopoly fishery management model has not been effective in assuming a sustainable fishery. It focuses on the limitation of uh, total catch uh, rather than right and uh, benefit of uh, fishermen as well as the economic of fishing industry. Capacity enhancing subsidies are a massive detriment to the uh, marine life. Uh, thus, <coughs> so we will mention also the initiative of uh, regional uh, fishery management uh, organization. Uh, RFMO uh, covers uh, only single <coughs> or some fish stock, but not all of area. And they lack competence to regulated fishery. The regulation have no binding effect on the third state who are not party. Uh, of the resonant conventions. Uh, for uh, only half of maritime boundary, so it's more than 500 cases uh, in the world have been formally agreed. So excessive unilateral maritime claim created a burden for both maritime delimitation and joint fishing zone and <coughs> fishing management. Yeah. So now, <clears throat> with sorry now we turn on the uh, second question it is the south china sea fishery situation uh, 
uh, so uh, next slide please uh, Southeast Asia uh, relied more heavily on fish at primary source of protein of shop creation and exportation than any region in the world uh, fish provide more than one third of the total intake of animal protein by person year in the region however Mm, uh, South Asia is uh, one of center of the world fishing crisis causes by uh, IUU, by overfishing uh, that led to uh, habitat loss and degradation, uh, depletion of marine living resources uh, to uh, marine uh, pollution and climate change also. More than half <coughs> of South Asia fishery are currently exploited at a uh, rate that put fish stock at medium of high risk of over exploitation. The near shore fishing exotic and South China Sea dispute as the leading cause to the overfishing and IUU in the region. Uh, <coughs> this, this, the second point is such as the annual uh, MZI based fishery management uh, modeling is uh, unlikely to be achieved from a uh, lack of uh, political uh, will. Uh, technical and human resources. The separation of species in catch in is uh, impractical uh, by the diversity of species and uh, multi gear character of the fishery. Uh, state of suffer from the lack of budget, uh, technical and human resources for data collection of uh, small scale fisheries. Uh, national stock assessment for the habit of uh, each individual species and migratory stocks are like a regular and consistent while the maritime delimitation, you know, that uh, is uh, unclear. So the lack of uh, tangible data and basic lead to complicated the calculation of MSSI, ETAC, and shape uh, <coughs> uh, You know that the uh, regional fishing organization uh, have a, a recommendation and technical assistance role rather than management. So it is a, we, 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 we have a um, management uh, fishery in the South East Asia. We have a South East uh, Asia Fishery Development, uh, SIPDEC, Asia Pacific Fishery Commission, uh, Regional Court of Conduct for Reponsipan Fishery, Western and Central Pacific Fishery Commission, uh, However, actually, um, there is no RFMO or multilateral agreement to govern integrated uh, fishery issue in the South China Sea. Uh, regional mechanism have a limited function on management and control of fishery quota, determination of MSSI, TAC, and asset ability to ship loose. The sea, uh, <clears throat> Yet the South China Sea has also tell uncertain economic uh, exclusive zone mm, uh, delineation. And, and you know that uh, maritime uh, conflict in the South China Sea has uh, aggravated the fishery crisis. So now, mm, what do we do for improving the situation? So uh, next slide, please. <coughs> I think that uh, it would uh, have more strengthened fishery regulation and enforcement uh, agency in the region. Uh, a, a monopoly uh, fishery uh, statement uh, of coastal state <coughs> modeling is not uh, enough uh, without the more active participation of uh, international organization in uh, monitoring, uh, control, and surveillance of the limited uh, fishery resources. So like uh, other region, the Southeast Asia uh, need to have a, a unified uh, IFMO uh, which stand the competence directed uh, from concerned state. And the second is so that uh, an overall fishing uh, investigation uh, must uh, clarify the proportion of catch for near shore and offshore fleets. 
uh, the reporting regime must be consistently and comprehensively for all the versions, uh, all the versions yes, yes, and all the country uh, place to reduce the size of small fisheries and uh, equip uh, GPS and uh, satellite monitoring for all the kind of persons. I think that uh, it, it's, um, it should have efforts uh, concentrated on the establishment of more MPA, yeah, <clears throat> marine protected area at national and regional uh, to conserve a sustainable environment to fishery varia. And it should have also a transparency in exchange of data and information. information. Uh, South East Asia state need a huge financial and technical assistance for FAO and other international organization. And uh, climate state uh, in South East um, <coughs> um, in, in South East Asia in the South China Sea, yeah, must think about the uh, open access of fishermen to this part under the monitoring, control, and surveillance or quota of a new RFMO fully treated by the agreement. So uh, it's uh, so all um, <coughs> from my uh, side. So I'm ready to answer any question from you. Uh, thank you uh, for the kind uh, attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ambassador Nguyen Hong Tao for your very succinct uh, presentation. Of course, we will have a question and answer session later on, but before Thank that, you. I would like to pose you a few questions for you to ponder and then give the answers when your turn comes up at the end of Bob Beckman's presentation. My first question is, in the South China Sea maritime conflicts, how is the uh, code of conduct being worked out by ASEAN and China try to deal with the fishery issues in the South China Sea in the so-called disputed area? This is my first question. My second question is that since October 2016, ASEAN has been trying to come up with the so-called ASEAN Common Fisheries Policy without any success. How would you suggest that ASEAN countries try to come to some kind of compromise in order to finalize the ASEAN Common Fishery Policy? My third point is that you mentioned about the need to to have a new regional fishery management organization. But you see, even now we have so many regional fishery management organizations in the ASEAN seas. For example, Indian Ocean Rim Association, the Bay Bengal Large Marine Ecosystem Project, the Southern Indian Ocean Fishery Agreement, but you see here we have ASEAN countries or so-called Southeast Asian countries bordering the Indonesian and those who do not. And we also have country like Myanmar, which has nothing, no maritime areas in the Pacific Ocean at all. So, so it's quite difficult to have some kind of comprehensive new agreement to cover the whole Southeast Asian countries when now only a few countries are parties to regional fishery management organization. So how would you uh, get around it in order to come up with a new comprehensive regional fishery management organization? I think this answer <laughs> uh, this question is so to come up. Not now, okay. I would, yeah. I would like to invite uh, okay. Dr. General Huang, Hong, sorry, to uh, give us a presentation on uh, states. Thank you. You have the floor, madam. Good afternoon, Judge, Professor Tomiko, and my good friend Nilufa. Thank you for inviting me to take part in this 
very august conference. The organizers have asked me to give a presentation on straits used for international navigation in the context of the Southeast Asia. So it will come as no surprise that I'm going to be focusing my attention on Straits of Malacca and Singapore, which I'm going to term as SOMS um, as the short form. Amongst the world's busiest international straits and two of the most important straits in Southeast Asia, our part of the world, are the Straits of Malacca and Singapore, connecting the Indian Ocean and the South China, and the South China Sea. The Malacca and Singapore Straits together extend approximately 520 nautical miles and are bordered by three, st three states, Indonesia, Malaysia and Singapore. They are the shortest sea routes between the Indian and Pacific Oceans. What you see on the screen shows the vessel traffic in the Straits in, in Soms on a Saturday morning this month. It is well known that these straits are one of the most difficult routes to navigate. The ever-increasing traffic through narrow channels, in fact less than three miles wide at the nar narrowest point in the Singapore Straits, coupled with sharp bends in the straits, create challenges for littoral and user states and the sh shipping community with respect to safety of navigation, security, and protection of the marine environment in these straits. I will first recap briefly the balance struck amongst different interests during the UNCLOS negotiations on the re regime for international straits, with special focus on transit passage rights. I will then discuss some of the developments and challenges we have experienced 40 years on. So first, the delicate balance struck in Part 3 of UNCLOS. The regime for straits in Part 3 is inextricably interwoven with other legal regimes under the UNCLOS. Part 3 was part of a package deal that balanced different interests of the international community. On the one hand, it recognised the interests of states in asserting sovereignty and jurisdiction, through the expansion of the territorial sea, creation of archipelagic waters and the EZ regime. On the other hand, maritime powers need to ensure warships continue to enjoy freedom of transit in international waterways and strategic choke points. The right of transit passage is especially critical for geographically disadvantaged states, which I would count Singapore. As one of these. The international community also requires the rights of navigation for international shipping and trade. It is thus clear that the preservation of rights of transit passage was an essential condition for the recognition of any expansion of territorial sea limits or new regimes for the exercise of sovereignty and jurisdiction over sea space. The UNCLOS guarantees for all states the freedom of transit through straits and rights of archipelagic sea lanes passage through archipelagic waters. Even among the states bordering Somme, different states were motivated by different interests at the third conference of UNCLOS. When part three was negotiated, Indonesia and Malaysia had already extended their territorial seas to 12 nautical miles in domestic legislation. Consequently, major portions of the, the Somme comprise overlapping territorial waters. Indonesia and Malaysia, joined by Singapore, initially supported a more restrictive regime of innocent passage in the Straits. Indonesia was also lobbying for recognition of the archipelagic regime and made a similar compromise with respect to archipelagic sea lane passage. So in order to get the expanded breadth 
of the territorial sea and the archipelagic concept accepted by other states, especially by the maritime powers, which were concerned about securing freedom of transit, Malaysia, Indonesia and other states eventually accepted the regime of transit passage in the Straits as well as archipelagic sea lanes passage. Since the coming into force of UNCLOS, Indonesia, Malaysia and Singapore have consistently reaffirmed the status of the SOMS as straits used for international navigation in which the right of transit passage applies. So a little about the right of transit passage. Prior to UNCLOS, the regime in straits was non-suspendable innocent passage. Delegations at the third conference had to devise a passage regime that provided for existing navigational interests through straits, while meeting interests of states, both in terms of their sovereignty and security interests, which stood to gain from expanded maritime zones. The right of transit passage was the bargain struck. This right was negotiated to be conferred equally on ships and aircraft. Maritime powers also wanted a right of transit that would be equivalent to freedom of navigation and overflight in the high seas. This is eventually reflected in the nature of transit passage being non-suspendable and provisions specifying that right cannot be impeded and providing additionally that transit passage may take place in the normal mode. This is generally understood to include submerged passage for submarines. On the other hand, to appease coastal states, this freedom is a narrow one that excludes the right to conduct any activity other than continuous and expeditious transit. The right also comes with restrictions for the benefit of states bordering straits. Maritime powers were willing to observe reasonable safety and pollution regulations consistent with the basic right of transit. So eventually, littoral states were given carefully circumscribed regulatory powers under Article 42. Um, since I'm speaking for Singapore, I, please bear with me when I introduce, I, I must introduce the Singapore Clause, which is embodied in Article 38.2. The second sentence of Article 38.2 deals with the special case of transiting to and from a state bordering the strait and is of particular significance to Singapore. The sentence thus came to be known during negotiations as the Singapore Clause. Singapore has a unique geography as a sea lock state in an international strait, enclosed by our neighbours, territorial seas and airspace. The concern was that without this sentence, transit to Singapore's ports would not be considered continuous and expeditious, such that ships would have to rely on less extensive rights of innocent passage, and aircraft would need prior permission for overflight of neighbours' territorial seas or airspace, to leave or enter Singapore. So adhering to the transit passage regime in part three is thus of vital interest to Singapore for both economic as well as security reasons. So Psalms 40 years on, I have shown um, another chart showing how busy the strait is. So the most obvious difference from 1982 is the sheer volume of international shipping today. The volume of containers passing through Singapore's ports last year reached a record number, more than double the volume in 2003. Most, but not all of the states, littoral states has reached agreements on maritime boundaries. So this, the, the second chart shows the agreed maritime boundary between Singapore and Indonesia. Um, to the south of Singapore, along the Singapore Strait. Our experience has been, whatever our differences in maritime claims and interests, we have not and 
in, in fact, allow this to get in the way of freedom of transit through the Straits. The rights and duties of states bordering Straits Article 42 allows coastal states to regulate transit passage in the straits within defined limits. Regulatory powers are subject to the general requirement of reasonableness and good faith. Coastal state regulation has sometimes spurred debate. So just to give one example, Singapore and other states disagreed with proposed measures in the Torres Strait, not in our part of the world, but still Singapore took part to register our disagreement with proposed measures um, under which ships may be prosecuted on their next entry into Australian ports for not taking pilotage services on voyages transiting the Torres Strait to other destinations. We noted that this had the effect of imposing a pilotage requirement for, for ships exercising transit passage rights. So broadly, Singapore was concerned that compulsory pilotage in the Torres Strait could set an undesirable precedent outside the Torres Strait and be applied to SOMS. If left unchecked, it could erode the right of transit passage in all international straits around the world. So we registered our concern. Um, I was told uh, by my Australian colleagues uh, rather too forcefully. But for Singapore, we, we, we felt that this was an important point to register. Fortunately, our, con our concern resonated with a number of states around the world. A group of around 22 states across geographic regions question the legality of such pilotage requirements. Singapore, however, provided an assurance that we recognise and fully appreciated the environmental concerns which underline this, this measure which Australia was thinking of imposing. And we also indicated that we, we would continue to encourage ships flying the Singapore flag to engage pilots, but our position was that this should not be made compulsory. This should come as no surprise. With our economic survival and security dependent on freedom of transit to and from our ports, Singapore simply cannot allow developments that would lead to the erosion of transit passage regime in international straits. So fortunately, um, eventually the measure was not implemented. So also to um, share, share with you some of the salutary cooperation activities between the three littoral states um, of SOMS. Significant increase in shipping, including the amount of oil passing through choke points in the SOMS, has led to greater burden in managing the straits. About a third of global container trade and one quarter of global oil trade transit through the SOMS each year. More sophisticated navigational aids to ensure safety and avert disastrous consequences resulting from incident would mean greater cost to the littoral states. The UNCLOS recognises that user states also have a stake and should share in the burden of protecting navigation and environment in the straits. So this resulted in Article 43, which provides for cooperation between user and littoral states bordering a strait. In our context, a cooperative mechanism was established in the SOMS in 2007 after consultation with user states and the shipping community. I understand it was the first time Article 43 was implemented in such a concrete, comprehensive framework. In terms of security in the SOMS, um, I will not um, speak as much because uh, my professor is going to be speaking on this topic. But just briefly, increased shipping trade has created more opportunities for crime. 
So the three littoral states have also strengthened cooperation significantly in the past two decades following international attention in the early 2000s on the, on the terrorism situation and security problems faced by merchant ships in the Straits. So the three states got together to launch what we call RECAP, which stands for Regional Cooperation Agreement on Combating Piracy and Armed Robbery Against Ships in Asia. Uh, this entered into force in 2006. So this is yet another salutary um, example of cooperation between the three states. In conclusion, UNCLOS has played a critical role in codifying, clarifying and creating legal norms for the oceans. Um, and if I may just digress, I personally think we owe a huge debt to the architects of UNCLOS and seated just right before me, Professor Tommy Koh. And of course, um, the, the late um, Ambassador Satyanandan. I had the good fortune of meeting him um, when I go to New York, to New York um, for the Legal Advisors Week. Prof. Tommy Koh and Prof. Jia Kuma would um, assign me, would task me to what I call pay my respects to the professor. And I have been um, the fortune of listening to a giant of a practitioner in Law of the Sea and one of the major architects of UNCLOS. He is a giant, but he is a gentle giant, uh, a total gentle gentleman. So in, in our case, Part three of UNCLOS is, to my mind, particularly innovative in balancing the diverse rights and interests of the different players and users of the sea. In the context of SOM, although there may be differences of views on how the provisions should be applied, all three states have, by and large, adhered to the terms and spirit of the transit passage regime. This has resulted in SOM's maintaining its importance as a major maritime artery through which half of global seaborne trade now passes. The track record of the three states cooperating to keep the straits open to vessels and not resort to unilateralism is a good one. We may have our differences on interpretation of UNCLOS. We may have differences on um, maritime boundaries for the remaining areas which have not been delimited. But when it comes to SOMS and Straits, all three states have generally adhered to the spirit of patri, of UNCLOS, and cooperated to ensure that these waterways remain open for international navigation, international shipping. So um, let me stop there. I think my time is up um, and I'll hand the floor back to Pia. Uh, Thank you very much, Director uh, General Hong. Uh, you have elaborated quite comprehensively the regime of international states. And uh, since 1982, there seems to be a new development, at least. Uh, that is the existence of the so-called autonomous underwater vehicle or AUVs. Many of them are used for military purposes. These AUVs are sometimes called unmanned underwater vehicles and they are usually operated by the Navy of foreign governments going in many parts of the world. My questions at this moment for you is uh, what is the position of the government of Singapore regarding the passage, the so-called submerged passage of AUVs? Thank you. 
interstate America and Singapore. Uh, you can respond to that after the presentation by Professor Bob Beckman. And I invite Bob Beckman to keep his presentation. Um, since uh, the PowerPoint is very long, I think almost 30, 40 pages, so I would suppose that you focus on the issues that will that are not already known to most of us here who are Lord of Sea experts. Bob, you have the floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Uh, I'll take this off. Thank you for uh, asking me to do this presentation. Piracy and armed robbery of ships in Southeast Asia. After two years or two days of doom and gloom by most of the speakers, I will say this will be a much more upbeat presentation. Uh, <laughs> Outline of the presentation, I'll first look at what impact 82 UNCLOS uh, had on piracy and armed robbery against ships. <clears throat> look at the issue from uh, late 1990s and early 2000s when it became a serious problem. Then some guides and reports from uh, RECAP uh, Information Sharing Center. And then a little bit about uh, piracy and armed robbery in 2021, the latest report. Uh, first, with respect to 1980 UNCLOS and piracy and armed robbery against ships in Southeast Asia, the rules were set long before UNCLOS, with jurisdiction over foreign ships and waters subject to sovereignty. Coastal states have sovereignty in their territorial seas subject to right of innocent passage. No state can exercise police power in the territorial sea of another state without their consent. Unresolved issues, of course, going into the UNCLOS where there is no agreement on the breadth of the territorial sea, and there was no agreement on whether archipelagic states could claim sovereignty over their archipelagic waters. Indonesia had proposed this at the first conference in the 50s. Uh, it was uh, rejected, rejected again at the second conference. So those were the outstanding issues. Jurisdiction over ships and waters outside of sovereignty prior to the 82 Convention were clear. But it was very simple then. It was territorial sea and high seas. High seas were all the waters seaward of the outer limit of the territorial sea. General principle, ships on the high seas are subject to the exclusive jurisdiction of the flag state. With one exception, one clear exception, warship of any state may seize a pirate ship. So piracy was the one exception. Uh, definition of piracy, I'd like to point this out as we go moveably to armed robbery against ships later. It's an illegal act of violence or detention or an act of depredation. It's a very serious crime. It's not an attempt. It's not a threat of violence. It's an act of violence or detention or an act of depredation. Crew or passengers of a private ship and directed on the high seas against another ship. That definition has been around since the 58 Convention. It remains exactly the same in the Law of the Sea Convention. Now, the impact of the 82 Convention on the rules on piracy was simply to change, reduce significantly the areas that are subject to the piracy rules because previously it was only the territorial sea, the water seaward of the territorial sea. But now you have the breadth of the territorial sea extended out to 12 nautical miles. Archipelagic states have sovereignty in archipelagic waters and they measure their territorial sea from the archipelagic baseline. And the piracy rules, however, apply seaward of the outer limit of the territorial sea because they apply on the high seas and in the economic zone. Article 58.2 makes it absolutely clear that the piracy rules, which are Articles 101 to 107, apply in the economic zone. So the piracy rule applies from the 12-mile limit seaward. 
uh, on this map, if you see that the base, everything's from the baseline, it's the 12 mile territorial sea, uh, and sometimes the baseline's an archipelagic baseline, but the, basically the high, the piracy rules apply beginning at the 12 mile limit of any state. Now, this is a major impact of the difference of where the piracy rules apply prior to the Law of the Sea Convention and after. Because that entire area, Indonesia is allowed to draw archipelagic baselines connecting outermost points of its outermost islands. That's that red line. About all of the waters of that greenish inside those red, are archipelagic waters subject to their sovereignty. Prior to the 82 convention, all they could draw was a three mile limit around each individual island. Now, archipelagic waters, I just looked up as I was preparing here. There are 17,000 islands in Indonesia, 81,000 kilometers of coastline. The archipelagic waters, territorial sea and inland waters comprise 2.7 million square kilometers. You add that to that, the blue space there, the economic zone, it's another 3.1 million square kilometers. But therefore, anything inside the red line and the little blue, the little greenish line, 12 mile limit from the red line is subject to no piracy. It's subject to the laws of Indonesia. So this is a major, major change. Similarly, the, Indonesia, uh, the Philippines, the blue lines along the main islands in the Philippines is their archipelagic baselines. Any attack on a ship with a 12 mile limit from those lines going out or any attack on a ship within the blue lines is within their sovereignty. It's not piracy. It's the laws of, Indonesia, the, of the Philippines that would apply. Southern half of the, I can't have a pointer here, but from the southern half of the Malacca Strait, from Port Klang, which is opposite the Kuala Lumpur, down to Singapore, from 1970 has been territorial sea of either Indonesia or Malaysia, uh, where the piracy rules would not apply, but there can't have piracy if it's territorial sea of the two countries. Similarly, the Indonesia-Singapore boundary, which uh, Daphne has shown you, means that the entire Singapore Strait is the territorial waters of either Singapore, Indonesia, or Malaysia, where again, there's no piracy there because it's waters under the sovereignty of the coastal states. South China Sea, you take the, the light blue areas would be the areas where piracy can take place as well as the orange areas. But inside the straight baseline claims, inside the archipelagic uh, claim of Indonesia and the archipelagic claim of Malaysia down in the uh, lower left-hand corner, those are the Natuna Islands. That's not, they're not disputed. Those islands are enclosed the Natuna Sea in the dark blue area there would be area that is indisputably the archipelagic waters of Indonesia with a 12 mile limit from there where it's again, no piracy can take place. Now, piracy and armed robbery of ships in Southeast Asia became an issue in the late 90s and early 2000s. The International Bar Maritime Bureau established Piracy Reporting Center in 1992 in Kuala Lumpur. There was a significant increase of attacks on ships in Southeast Asia, late 1990s, early 2000s. Due, my reading is due to the 1997 economic crisis, the instability in Indonesia at the fall of the Suharto government and a separatist movement in the province of Aceh leading to uh, some serious attacks, including taking of hostages in that area. IMB report in 2000 stated the largest number of attacks in the world were in Southeast Asia and the most dangerous waters in the world were in Indonesia. Uh, but measures taken in, uh, it came to a head or more serious in June 205 when the Joint War Committee of Lloyd's declared the Straits of Malacca and Singapore war risk area. Result of that was trilateral cooperation at a 
unprecedented level between Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. Trilateral coordinated patrols, eyes in the sky, aerial patrols. It probably enhanced uh, good feelings. I'm not sure you can spot pirates from a from a aerial patrol. It probably, I probably unless you're going at two in the morning, I'm not sure it would work. But it did enhance cooperation. And Thailand cooperated in the eye and skies. Special arrangements, which are relating to hot pursuit across boundaries, which are confidential arrangements. More sharing of information between the three literal states resulted in a significant drop. Plus, you had, again, about the same time, the RECAP, Regional Co Cooperation Agreement on Combating Piracy that was partly instituted by, as far as I understand, by Japan. Also, the IMO had a role in others. But you had the first regional agreement, the region being the target area, not the parties to it. Uh, there was the first government-to-government -government agreement to promote and enhance cooperation against piracy. Two years later, the Information Sharing Center was established in Singapore. You now have 21 contracting parties from not just Southeast Asia, from South Asia, East Asia, Europe, and America. They work with partner organizations like the IMO, Interpol, the shipping organizations, World Maritime University. Indonesia and Malaysia are formally not parties to the agreement, but they do participate in the meeting as observers. Uh, now we come back to armed robbery against ships, taken in part from IMO documents, I believe. It's exactly the same as the definition of piracy, except it takes place in waters under a contracting party's jurisdiction. Uh, there's also no requirement of two ships being involved in their definition, but like piracy, it's a very serious offense. To qualify strictly under armed robbery against ships, it must be violence or detention or an act of depredation. Uh, in practice, that definition has been ignored by the RECAP ISC because in, from the point of view of the shipping industry, anytime somebody unauthorized boards your ship, your crew members are at risk, and therefore they don't they think they ought to be looking at more than acts of violence, but they should be looking at any, any, any unauthorized boarding. So RECAP classifies all the incidents of an unauthorized boarding or an attempted boarding, and they qualify them by a violence factor, an economic factor. Uh, for categories, time doesn't permit me to go into detail, but cat category one are the most serious where the crew is injured or threatened with violence. Category two, they may be threatened and held hostage temporarily. By category four, the perpetrators are not armed and they usually leave the ship if somebody notices they're there. So is nothing, there's no threat of violence, even a threat of violence, certainly nothing that's serious. Success of recap, they've dealt with all un unauthorized boardings in port or in, at sea in the region. They've encouraged the coastal states and ship owners to work together. They've developed best practice guidelines for ships to follow to prevent piracy. Uh, and they've created, I think, a good rapport of ships working together, our ship owners working with coastal states, but coastal states also all working together with their, with their uh, coast guards, et cetera. Interesting, they've published several guides and reports. There have been some periods when there were more serious incidents, and RECAP has helped resolve them, and the coastal states' cooperation has resolved them more. There was one period from 2008 to 2011 when tugboats and barges were the target of uh, groups in, South, in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore and South China Sea. They hijacked these ships, well-organized and pre-planned. Recap issued a tugboats and barges guide and eventually the problem was resolved. There's also a period between 2011 and 2015 when siphoning of fuel from tankers and the stealing of the fuel was an issue that's also been resolved through cooperation of the three states. RECAP, again, was a greatly assisted it by issuing special reports, guide to the tanker operators. 
Uh, they've issued general comprehensive regional guides to ship, to, uh, ship owners and ship operators to, and coastal states to, on how to report, et cetera. And they just issued the version two of this guide this, this year. Uh, most serious incidents that were that in the region were the abduction of crew in the Sulu Selvi Sea uh, off the coast of Saba and between Philippines, Indonesia, and Saba. These were kidnapping for ransom in the tri boundary area carried out by Abu Sayyaf, an extremist group in southern Philippines. No agreements on boundaries in this area, so it wasn't clear who had jurisdiction. Recap again, cooperated by publishing a guide, and the three states worked together, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Philippines, to tackle the problem in an informal way. Uh, this, that's the area concerned. It's the eastern province of, uh, on the island of Borneo of Saba. That's the southern part of the Philippines, and then down to the right would be Indonesia. So it's an area by where it's been a lawless area for a very long time. That's to give you an example there of where some of the incidents were. Uh, Recap issued guidance and examining the mode of the perpetrators and treatment of the crew. 75 crew members were abducted, 65 released, 10 either killed or died. Perpetrators were uh, two to 20 men armed with firearms. So this was clearly the most serious of the incidents in this region. Uh, Recap again set out guidance to, uh, on the abduction of crew and put in recommended transit corridors where ships were to call into the Philippine Coast Guard, et cetera, et cetera. Protocol of, for ship owners or ship operators or captains if there was an emergency. And they put in transit corridors uh, for the recommended travel for the ships that were in the area. Uh, piracy and armed robbery of ships in Southeast Asia in 2021, the past year. The report just came out. I thought I'd make a few points. No piracy incidents. Now, RECAP is now looking at where the incident took place, even though the navigational charts in this area don't show you where the, where the territorial sea is, so you don't know whether you're in an area where the piracy rules apply or where you're, whether you're in an area subject to national jurisdiction. 82 incidents they called armed robbery against ships, but a lot of those were very low level. No abduction of crew, no category one incidents at all, only eight they categorized in category two. 53 or 69% were category four. Category fours were almost nothing. They, they, they board the ship and they, someone sees them and they jump back off. So relatively, I would argue, under control. Only area there was an increase. Okay, I'll just take one, two more, a couple more slides. Only area was an increase was in the Singapore Strait. Increase of incidents from 2020 to 20, 2021 from 34 to 49, but very low level of violence by the perpetrators, uh, except in the Manila. And those are the incidents in the Singapore Strait. Most of them are in the eastbound lane which is on the Indonesian side of the boundary. I shouldn't say that. The government doesn't say it, but I'll say it. So and they're all in the Indonesian side of the boundary coming from Batam or Bintan. The usual mode is they're stealing spare parts for engines or they're stealing a laptop or whatever they get their hands on. Very low level, no violence. Uh, they're petty crimes. They probably don't meet the definition of armed robbery against ships, right? So. Papers make it sound like it's a serious incident. I would argue that uh, things are more or less under control. Very few incidents reach the level required to be either piracy or armed robbery. Uh, and none of them would meet the threat or violence. Uh, threat, there's a threat of violence in a few cases, but certainly no violence in the, in the Strait of Malacca and Singapore. So conclusions quickly. UNCLOS brought the major shipping lanes in Southeast Asia under sovereignty of the coastal states. Very few attacks are within the definition of serious offenses. The informal cooperation between the literal states, whether it's Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, or Malaysia, Philippines, and Indonesia, at an operational level, they've worked together to resolve most of the problems without formal agreements. 
Uh, and RECAP and the ISC has greatly encouraged the cooperation. They've now expanded it. They do capacity building for Coast Guards in the region, et cetera. Okay, thank you all very much. Sorry for running over. Thank you very much. Also, Bob Beckman, for your presentation. This is quite uh, educational. I have two questions which um, you may like to answer uh, now. Why are not Indonesia and Malaysia party to recap? What are reasons for not being party to this very important uh, initiative? And what do observers like Indonesia and Malaysia do? That's my first question. My second question is, when you mentioned uh, about recaps, categories, and incidents, I look at the list, that's very impressive, but I wonder whether recap or some other bodies or governments in Southeast Asia, they will try to bring in the, the applications of the organization on transnational organized crimes, because you just imagine there could be some kind of organized criminal gangs that would fit the definitions of transnational organized crimes under that convention. And here we have even the broader scope of cooperation among Southeast Asian states. I would like to invite uh, also Beckman to answer the two questions, and then we go to uh, Ambassador Yen Hong Tao for his answer, and then Director General uh, Wong for a response to my questions, and then I would invite the audience to post questions to the panelists. Bob, you have the floor. Thank you. <coughs> in, in, with respect yeah. to your first question as to why the Indonesian government and Malaysia are not formal parties to the RECAP agreement, I am afraid I have no inside information that would enable me to answer that question directly. Some of the suspicions, perhaps, of observers would be that Indonesia feels that RECAP was created to point a finger at incidents that occur primarily within those waters, and that Indonesia, as I said, has thousands of kilometers of square water to control, and it has many issues with respect to maritime crimes in terms of smuggling of fuel, smuggling of people, smuggling of uh, drugs and other contraband, and it therefore feels that a special agreement was to point a finger at it and deal only with commercial shipping that passes through their waters, but they don't benefit other than the Europeans and East Asians and Singapore benefit more <coughs> than they do. So if you look at it from their perspective, the, that area is one small issue in the thousands of square kilometers that they have to deal with. In Malaysia, I just don't know, perhaps to be sympathetic to Malaysia, to Indonesia, but both have been cooperating and both are attending the meetings. Uh, and I think there is, at a practical level, that what, what the people you talk to would say, at an operational level, they cooperate. And maybe there's no formal agreement of the foreign ministries, but the Maritime Enforcement Agency of Indonesia, or of Malaysia and Baklama and Singapore, probably exchange information. Uh, your second question, whether there's other transnational crimes, and again, ASEAN is looking at transnational crimes as a slightly different issue. Uh, some of the offenses might take the might meet the international maritime crimes conventions of either hostage taking or SUA, but again, we have the issue of neither Indonesia or Malaysia are party to the uh, SUA convention of '88. Uh, and, and therefore, that convention is not a useful tool as well. But again, even though those conventions don't apply, the three states have cooperated, in my view, to keep the issue more or less under control. Thank you, Bob. Uh, could Ambassador Yen Hong Tao now give your answer to my questions? You have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you, Zas uh, Krishak. 
just uh, give me uh, three questions related to the South China Sea Code of Conduct. Uh, the 2016 ASEAN Framework of uh, Fishery Cooperation uh, and also the role of the regional uh, fishery uh, management organization. Yeah. So, <clears throat> on the first question, uh, um, I would uh, remind you that by the uh, agreement of uh, negotiators <coughs> of uh, <coughs> claimant party, <coughs> sorry, the draft of a court of conduct uh, is kept in secret, so I, I cannot uh, <laughs> comment uh, any uh, uh, provision in the future, yeah. <coughs> if, uh, it, if I have. Yeah. Uh, however, I remember that uh, uh, that Krinshak uh, <coughs> and me, we involved also <coughs> in the earlier period of drafting uh, DOC declaration on the conduct of the party in the South China Sea. Uh, and the uh, point four of the DOC mentioned that uh, the party concerned undertake to resolve the Chaturian and jurisdictional uh, dispute uh, by peaceful means without restoring to the threat or use of force uh, through friendly consultations and negotiation by sovereign state directly concerned in accordance uh, with the uh, universally recognize the principle of international law, including the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So I think that the fishery uh, activity, fishery cooperation will be undertaken in the framework of the UNCLOS by the claimant state in the Southeast Asia. Uh, <coughs> On the second question, uh, so that uh, ASEAN uh, has uh, also um, <coughs> uh, in uh, 2016, yeah, you know that it's a strategic plan of action of ASEAN cooperation on fishery for the period of 2016, uh, 2000. Uh, 22, yeah, and the, the strategic, uh, strategic uh, sick, yeah, I know that's, uh, so ASEAN want to further development regional initiative to promote a repulsive and fishery management uh, mechanism taking into account uh, the specific social, economic, cultural, ecological, and institutional context and diversity of ASEAN and ASEAN fishery in the development of the ASEAN economic community and the ASEAN social, cultural community. So ASEAN is ready to cooperate with regional organization for sustainable fishery management. <coughs> and if uh, we take account uh, the, <coughs> um, the impact of the South China Sea Award, uh, so that now we have uh, also one part in the central part of the uh, South China Sea is the high sea beyond the, uh, the, the EAZ of each claimant. So if uh, ASEAN and China have a compromise to turn this uh, zone to the joy uh, fishing zone, so I think that it is a, a very good uh, a solution for all claimant parties. And um, uh, <coughs> we have also some proposition uh, on establishment of uh, marine parks yeah, in the uh, Paracel and in the Spatly, yeah, uh, for 
reduce the site of uh, over exploitation uh, and uh, <coughs> a sustainable protection of uh, regional fishing resources. So I think that uh, ASEAN can make also compromise with uh, China uh, <coughs> and uh, the role of the uh, regional uh, fishing management organization is very important yeah, to have uh, uh, the management of the joint um, <coughs> uh, fishing zone and experience uh, from uh, Vietnam, China, uh, joint fishing zone in the Gulf of Tonkin can be applied. Yeah. So we, we have uh, many initiatives, but it depends on the political will of China and ASEAN. And I think that uh, with the uh, solidarity and cooperation, we will uh, move forward uh, to the sustainable uh, fishery uh, solution in the region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And uh, I think Bob and I and you maybe can also remember that during um, the track two discussion about the South China Sea disputes, we also raised the idea of the so-called following uh, the Antarctic agreement model, how to cooperate on fishery issues. And some of us even mentioned about the understanding of cooperation between the UK and Argentina in the case of the Falkland Marvinas. So I think maybe this issue can come up again in terms of constructive dialogue with among the parties concerned. So I would now turn to Director General Hong for the response to my questions. We also have another question from the audience, which I would like to ask uh, the Director General now. Could the Director General give examples of challenges of literal states over ships in transit passage? Because you mentioned your presentation that literal states has so many challenges in this regard. Maybe you can give us examples. Uh, of these challenges. The reason I ask you now is because my internet connections is quite unstable, you know, it's come on and off. I think it shut down twice during um, this session. So when I have time, I pose the questions to you. If something goes wrong, then maybe the organizer will carry on. Thank you, um, Ambassador. Um, Dr. General Hall, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Your first question was um, whether Singapore has a position with regard to autonomous vessels, um, if I got you uh, correct. So uh, let me start with saying that actually Singapore um, does not as yet have a position as such. In fact, we are working, we are collaborating with the Centre for International Law to study this issue of autonomous vessel. One of the questions we are studying is even how, how are countries around the world treating this issue? And my officers inform me that we're even studying the question of autonomous vessels. Are they vessels that fall within the definition of vessels in UNCLOS? For example, um, autonomous vessels may not have master of vessel. There's no crew. So does that make this floating object a non-vessel. So we are, we are actually studying this, this issue. We don't have a national position as such. But let me offer my personal view um, with the caveat that it may well change as we study the, the, the issue um, at a deeper level. For, for myself, I see the UNCLOS as embodying a very carefully calibrated set of rights where trade-offs amongst different rights, amongst different interest groups were achieved. It now offers a very good constitution for the oceans that clarifies what the rules 
that ought to apply to use of the ocean. So my personal view is to the extent that we want to regulate autonomous vessels, I would personally go for default position whereby the, the normal rules of UNCLOS, including transit passage rights, should apply to such vessels. I'm aware that um, autonomous vessels have been categorized into different types. I mean, if you have a vessel whereby it is partially autonomous, as in we are using technological advancement to facilitate the safe maneuvering, the safe management of such flights, as far as I'm, my personal view is, those should still form, fall within the definition of vessels. There are also vessels whereby there are no crew, there's no master, but you can have human beings remotely with the benefits of technology control the vessel, but from a remote location. Again, I see this as vessels and the normal rules of UNCLOS should apply to such vessels. So by and large, I would go for a default position whereby UNCLOS, having now settled what the regime, what the law should be when it comes to users of the sea, should continue to apply to, to such vessels. Of course, there are challenges. There are some provisions in the UNCLOS which refers specifically to master of the ship, crew of the ship, and of course, when we apply such provisions to autonomous vessels without a crew or, 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 or a master, there will be challenges. But I think um, in the spirit of compromise, there, there, there will come a time when the international community will get together, I hope, to discuss then how do, we in, how do we apply, how do we interpret UNCLOS in the light of such technological advancement? Um, Judge, you also asked the question, you, or, or rather you made the observation that such autonomous vessels are frequently deployed um, for use by, by the military. At a practical level, I see it as for, for such vessels that are deployed by the military, um, in the first place, how the, the vessel, I mean, if you consider that a vessel, would enjoy immunity under UNCLOS. So I suppose um, to that extent, I mean, states would feel that they, they have a right to deploy and, and while doing so, such vessels or, 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 or such um, thing, um, if you don't consider it a vessel, would enjoy um, immunity. Or, or even if it doesn't fall within UNCLOS, then the normal international law principles of sovereign immunity would apply to this thing if it is not a vessel um, as recognised by UNCLOS. So, bottom line, I see it as um, it may be that state practice would also give us some answers um, as to how such vessels should be treated uh, going forward. Um, the, the, the question that's posed by um, the audience, um, I understand is to elaborate a little on what are the challenges faced by the littoral um, states when managing uh, straits use for international navigation. Um, what I have covered in the early days when we were negotiating UNCLOS, the three states were concerned about the, the, the cost of having to, say, um, establish, maintain apparatus to, to enable the safe navigation and safe use of the straits. So there was concern that the cost, um, there should be equitable sharing with the users of the straits. But um, in reality, by today, I would say that the challenges of maintaining the straits um, is no longer as, as acute as in the early days when 
the UNCLOS was being negotiated. In fact, ironically, one, one of the, the things that um, literal states would have to ensure is when there are um, capsized of vessels, it may then block safe passage um, of vessels using the straits. So in reality, on the ground, there are agreements between the three states that for humanitarian reasons, whichever state has got um, their navy or state vessel in the vicinity will have a right to extend assistance to the vessel in distress or to deal with the, the, the capsized um, situation. Um, the traffic separation scheme has also been established in a large part of, of the strait, and there is agreement amongst the three states as to which of the three states is in charge of which segment of the traffic um, separation scheme that is established for, for, for use. So in, in practice, the, the challenges that have been faced in when UNCLOS was first negotiated, I would say is um, um, past. So this is why I've made the observation that insofar as straits use for international navigation is concerned and the practice of the three states on the ground, the track record is a good one. In fact, um, in the areas where where there are questions or issues on delimitation and um, waters, ownership of the waters belonging to which state. Where there's a contest, when, when there is an incident on the ground, you'll see all three states at breakneck speed sending police vessels and the Navy to the, the, the spot where the incident is in order to assert sovereignty over the waters. So you, you will see this, this scramble for, for, for assistance by all three states. So um, I see that as something that is happy as long as help is being rendered to the, the capsized um, vessel and to rendering rescue and support um, efforts on the positive side, I see that as that's a good thing. So it's a long way of um, explaining that in terms of challenges, this is a very narrow strait, very, very congested, with many, many vessels um, passing by each day. The, the three states, I think, are alive to the necessity to keep these waterways open for, for international navigation and international use. So the cooperation on the ground is actually present. So the challenges are very much uh, minimized. Thank you very much, uh, Director General. And uh, I'm very impressed with your answer to the first question too. And I would humbly suggest that any government, including government of Singapore, we look at, um, you know, the issue came up in the 2018 Jesus Mood competition. So you may uh, you may ask the and your students who participate in the Jesus Mood competitions what their views are in their pleadings and oral arguments. So that will be very useful. So we have uh, a chance to allow the audience to post questions from the floor or in chat. Anyone would like to ask questions from the floor? Yes, Judge, we have one or uh, two questions. So I uh, will go very quickly because uh, Judge Gansak has to leave soon. So we'll take the questions in succession. Thank you for um, very good specific <laughs> presentation on very different topics. <laughs> they were all, they all niche areas in their own, in their own rights. Um, I have a question on fisheries, which is really the only topic I know a few things about. <laughs> and so, so it's, um, it's for Prof. Duen. Um, I, it's a bit of a wishful question to you. Uh, you mentioned the fact that um, it would be uh, necessary to have an RFMO in the South China Sea at some point 
in order to uh, adequately manage uh, fish stocks. I wanted to ask you uh, two questions linked to that. Do you think that there is any prospects for CIFDEC to um, become maybe first simply a little more of a standing committee before looking at quotas? It could be more visible in providing um, fish stock assessments for commercially important fish stocks could think about, you know, the Spanish mackerel um, or some other of those fish stocks which are fished throughout the South China Sea and the Gulf of Thailand and are commercially important for all the, um, the people around um, uh, from all the, all the coastlines. We all have each country has its own nickname to, for, the, for the spotted Spanish mackerel. Um, they <laughs> uh, and they cook it and they love it. So, um, linked to that, when the fishing refuge, the, the fish refu fisheries refugia, sorry, work started uh, initially within UNEP work, and progressively, I mean, it has then moved onto CIFDEC, which is now the implementing agency. The initial work really focused on some specific, some species that were of commercial importance and each of the, uh, the fisheries um, government representatives who were involved uh, did quite a lot of work then and identified regionally important and commercially regionally important species. Yet when we look at the evolution, now the fisheries refugia have led to the identification of more like pilot sites, which are rather small and tend to uh, focus on different species in different countries, uh, coastal states involved, um, and not really on uh, straddling or shared stocks, and certainly not the same species in the different countries. And so I'm wondering whether mechanisms such as fisheries refugia, if they were taken by the states who have become a member to, uh, uh, to, the, to the UNFSA, to the United Nations Fish Stock Agreement, uh, so you know, obviously it's primarily Indonesia, uh, Thailand and Vietnam for now, but the southern part of the basin, and were to focus on some, not all, but just a better understanding of some straddling fish species, could we progressively move to a, uh, a more, um, a, a new sort of version of work of CIVDEC that could progressively take us on the path of an RFMO? Thank you. Thank you, Yona. Uh, I think this will have to uh, be our last Ambassador, question. Before, 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 before uh, you answer, I think um, I have some other important appointments to go. So I would suggest as follows. Uh, the session continues without me. And uh, you can ask the questions until any time you like. But I really have to go. So I will leave it to the MC to, um, to conduct the question and answer questions. My apologies, because if you just stick to my timetable, then it will somehow uh, end prematurely this very interesting session. So please excuse me and thank, thank you for allowing me to, yes. to, to be here with you. And please carry on. Thank you. Judge, thank you so much. We appreciate your taking the time from your busy schedule to be with us. And I think we're going to have to end the session. Apologies, Yuna but we are on a very strict time schedule as well. <laughs> so the question maybe can be answered by ambassador by email. Apologies to all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judge. And uh, yes, that ends our panel. <laughs> uh, we'll keep uh, Ambassador Nguyen uh, on screen, yep. please, for the panel photo. Uh, and then we'll call on all of the speakers uh, shortly after this panel photo. Thank you.